You've seen the photos. Nairobi's dump sites stretching to the horizon, plastic choking rivers, garbage trucks groaning through gridlock. That is the city story we know. But just 70 kilometers away, another city tells a different story. Here, no bins overflow, no smoke, no stench. Because in Konza, the trash doesn't even hit the streets. It disappears underground. I'm Steve Mokaya, and together with the African Voice crew, we went to see what happens when a city plans for a clean future from the very start. Come along with us. Konza was planned as a smart city, clean, efficient, future ready. But from the start, one question stood out. How do you build the future without dragging yesterday's garbage along? So they wove the automated solid waste collection system into the master plan, a system built from the scratch to make trash disappear even before it hits the streets. A drive through Konza streets tells the story, not a single piece of trash in sight. We meet engineer Kibara Mwangi, one of the brilliant minds behind this futuristic setup. Here is where it all begins. These aren't ordinary beans. They are smart beans with sensors that know when they are full. Their sensors send a signal and then whoosh, the waste is sucked underground. It travels more than two kilometers to the actual management system. So this is where all the waste uh, comes <coughs> yes, to yes. via the underground tunnel? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. Yes. And it could be in a some sort of industries. Yes. We follow Mwangi to where the real magic happens. Behind this quiet warehouse door is a silent, wordless humming that makes all the difference. And like what you'd expect from a waste system, this place is clean, almost pristine. So where we are standing at the moment is uh, what we call the automatic solid waste handling facility. Ideally where all the solid waste garbage that you'd normally collect uh, uh, is conveyed to. Uh, how this works uh, is a very simple. Uh, consider uh, what you'd do with a vacuum cleaner. Uh, on a very small scale, you pick out uh, waste uh, from a vacuum that has been created, uh, creates a low uh, pressure area, uh, of course uh, sucks the waste to a central area, and then from that uh, point you can be able to utilize that waste uh, in different ways. We are talking about uh, solid waste handling and not uh, solid waste, of course, uh, disposal, because after you've been able to collect that waste, you should be able to have uh, other areas that you're going to repurpose this. The system uh, as set out uh, is from Envac. That's a Spanish uh, company that has been able to do this. They've been uh, in existence for more than uh, 50 years. Uh, they've been rolling this out in many other areas. This is the first of a kind in Africa that is being uh, undertaken, and we are happy that uh, it is being housed uh, here at Konza Technopolis. Okoth Peter, the person who oversees environment, health, and safety at Konza, explains the basic principles of this system. You find that uh, if you look at the uh, Sustainable Solid Waste Management Act 2022, it measures all stresses on waste segregation at source. So the system that is currently in uh, Kotda that has been installed and is uh, operational, purely there will be waste segregation into four chambers or four color-coded dustbins. We have plastics, we have organics, uh, we have uh, commingled, that is mixed waste, and then we have uh, those papers and all the likes. So once the dustbins are filled up, it will sense automatically the system will sense if it is the paper or plastic bin that is full then it will move it will be evacuated it is a vacuum like system it will be transported to the compacting base it, it's roughly around 14 kilometers the waste moves underground but konza does it stop at collection it transforms waste gives it a second life at the compaction center, trash is sorted. Some of it is incinerated to generate energy. So once uh, it reaches a, a certain level of compaction, it will be compacted. Compaction means you will reduce the volume that can be carried. It, it makes it, that's more of a, a, a value addition. Then at that level, we have two options. We are thinking, we are in the process of doing waste to energy. That is the same waste that will convert to energy through incineration. We are also thinking of doing organic manure or organic fertilizer. So once the organic uh, dustbin is full, it will be transported to the organic chamber. That's where we'll now cumulatively collect it and use it to, uh, for uh, composting. We are thinking of introducing black fly soldiers as a, a means or a, 
uh, one of the composting agents. So we'll be doing, doing black fly soldiers at the same time doing organic manure. Because in Konza we have allocated land for smart agriculture. With the smart agriculture we have to use organic fertilizer. Where are we going to get it? We are going to. Then even in our smart tree nursery we are going to use the same organic manure that will generate from composting. We have four fractions of waste that we collect at Konza Technopolis. We have paper, we have mixed waste, we have uh, plastic uh, and uh, cardboard or what ideally would be the, any other uh, fraction of waste that uh, comes in. Why do we have those uh, fractions of waste? Because paper has immediate use. Uh, there are people who do recycling of paper, like um, uh, toilet paper, uh, uh, of course, uh, those people who are into manufacturing of toilet papers or any other paper that does not need uh, the first uh, round of uh, uh, tree cutting for it to be able to be, to be manufactured. Uh, we also need uh, plastics to be collected. Of course, there are people who are doing uh, recycling of plastics. Uh, other things, of course, like metal or anything that would be collected in the system that has immediate uh, reuse. So that's, uh, and then the mixed waste that goes to the fertilizer production. So those are some of the things that we've been able to do. Uh, happy to note that the system is uh, up running, of course, uh, and just waiting for the inhabitants uh, to come and uh, create it. Mm. Maybe going on a technical, uh, uh, into the technical details of how the system works. Yeah? We have uh, what we call receptacles, ideally the areas where you put in the waste. Uh, we also have, uh, of course, uh, the pipe network. Uh, that is underground. It's a steel uh, pipe network, uh, 500 millimeters in diameters. As we said, the, the receptacles are four at every uh, one point. And then again, uh, we have two uh, networks uh, in this city. That's the east and the west network. Ne network uh, where we are standing in now. This is the west network. Eh? Uh, the east network is on the other side, uh, basically here at the solid waste handling facility. And uh, why we have these two networks is because the system works best uh, on a range of uh, a, a distance of about 2.5 to 3 kilometers. So we've divided the city into those two areas. The east uh, covering 2.5 kilometers, the west covering 2.5 kilometers, so that uh, we can have uh, an efficient system. If anything bigger than that, uh, in distances or longer than that in distances uh, is uh, something that is considered. It means that you need to have a uh, huger uh, exhausters uh, that would ideally mean that you're using more power and uh, reducing on the sustainability. So what we plan to do is have three or four of these type of uh, solid waste handling facilities uh, on either sides of the city just to ensure that we are uh, not just uh, handling waste but doing it in a sustainable way. But systems mean nothing without people. Konza is surrounded by tracts of ancestral land. People lived here long before blueprints were drawn. The city is trying, slowly, to bring them into the vision. It's also thinking about trees, animals, and the communities around it. So what do you do with the communities? Uh, there are so many activities like uh, tree growing. Like? Tree growing. Okay. Uh, we also do nursery management, tree nursery management. Uh, uh, capacity building uh, when it comes to small uh, SMEs, those who want to establish their own tree nurseries, and uh, there is the issues of uh, solid waste. Uh, we do have uh, cleanups with the communities and uh, may maybe education on uh, rainwater harvesting. Okay. You know, this is an assault, arid and semi arid areas, so we have to work together. So, but why would you care about the, com the communities? I mean, one because the yeah. buffer zone, one, the, our key stakeholder as Konza is the community. Apart from NGOs, uh, universities, research institutes, KWS, KFS, the key stakeholder is uh, community. Reason, that's where we get our indigenous knowledge system. This is a technopolis. Technology also comes hand in hand with the indigenous knowledge system. Like you find in our neighborhood, we have uh, community members who can handle bees. These are an area that is highly infested by bees. We coexist with the bees. Even as you move around, you'll find your interaction with bees. But it reaches a time that when they get into the offices, there's a, a community member who can come and relocate the bees without killing them. We have a bee section within the wildlife corridor where the, he relocates them into beehives yeah. and there you know that's now apiculture is an economic activity mm. we have already enjoyed honey from the bees within Koza. we don't kill them we coexist yeah. mm. don't you think it's a bit uh, ironic that these uh, 
it is a, a, take, a, take, a tech hub and you also heavily relying on the people, I mean from the uh, knowledge from the community. Indigenous knowledge system is very key. As much as this uh, tech hub, there's uh, the tech and there's the indigenous knowledge system. Even if any, any form of management, these are people who are or the, the, the natives of this area. They have lived with these animals before. They have interacted with this ecosystem before. So we cannot do without that knowledge. Looking ahead, Konza has reserved a thousand acres for a wildlife conservancy. Once registered with the Kenya Wildlife Service, it will shelter endangered species, birds, big mammals, maybe even the antelope whose hooves don't echo on concrete. In terms of wildlife, we, uh, we collaborate with the KWS. Mm. During dry season, we establish water points for these wild animals, wildlife. We have several water points, around five. Within the... Yeah, within the Konza. Konza. Okay. We replenish, we clean and replenish them during the dry season so that the animals don't uh, strain mm. in terms of water supply. Then how safe is this place? Uh, well, almost I think that includes even the... Um, the key animals that uh, have habited this area before and now, we have ostrich, we have zebras, we have buffaloes, but you know, they move freely. So the animal that you see in Konza today, you'll find it in another part of Nairobi National Park. Mm. So they are not permanent here. We don't control or we don't cage them. They easily move. But most of the wildlife, they are not dangerous uh, mm. wildlife. That, uh, uh. Okay. But uh, once in a while, we have experienced the issues of cheetahs. And as I told you, that we use, we collaborate with KWS and the local communities to manage them so that the place is safe and the animals are also safe. While Konza has received criticism for delays in meeting its 2030 completion goal, Mwangi explains this shortcoming. Such detailed cities and systems, he says, take time and lots of effort. Uh, this is a complex project, very complex, uh, in that uh, it needed, uh, among other things, that the master planning be done first uh, for the city. Uh, that was done uh, by the master delivery partners, uh, that's the American uh, uh, consultant. Uh, after that, uh, we had to go through a phase of now creating uh, the codes smart city codes that could be utilized in uh, Kenya. You note that uh, for most of the infrastructure that we are doing, roads and uh, buildings, the codes that have been uh, used in the country are the 1968 and the 1972 codes, ideally. Those will not work in a smart city uh, so you context. Uh, the codes are ideally what engineers or planners use uh, for them to be able to do like planning. Uh, if you say you are building a house, what are you checking, what parameters are you using to check against uh, this? So for example, you'd say that uh, the British standard codes, which are used uh, uh, worldwide, uh, they might, pre uh, they might uh, prescribe to you uh, the sp wind speeds that you can be able to use for you to design a building that can be able to sus sustain a certain uh, strength uh, usage or something of the sort. So for us to be able to come up with codes of that nature, we needed, of course, uh, to customize codes for this city a smart city, uh, the first, of course, uh, from a greenfield uh, in Africa again. Uh, from that point, of course, uh, get uh, approvals on the same, uh, which we've since uh, gotten the approvals on. Uh, after that, we had to do what we call the pilot projects, uh, basically to ensure that people are appreciating what we are doing for them to be able to come uh, onto the project. So those were done uh, with the help of other ministries. Ministry of Water sank boreholes uh, for us. Uh, Kura, uh, the Kenya Urban Roads Authority, uh, did the initial access roads, basically to just uh, sell the dream to those who would want to come into the area, given that it was just a vast area of land. So after those initial steps uh, had been undertaken. We built our headquarters building, sometimes back, started in, sometimes back in 2016, and with that we ideally had a place that we could be able to sell the dream from. Uh, so sometimes back in 2018, we were able to get the financing for the 400 acres of land. Eh? Uh, this was through what we call an EPCF model, an engineer, procure, contract, and a finance model. So it's something that really, uh, of course, spurred the growth of the city uh, all of a sudden. Uh, from 2018 to now, 
we've been able to do the 400 acres and that has uh, allowed us of course to just set the standards uh, as we would have wished. If we had done this earlier, it would have meant that we used the earlier codes of the country. If we had done this earlier, it would have meant that we did not fully master plan the city and uh, some of these innovations uh, would not really have gotten a chance. So anything that is good takes time. So basically you're saying that um, it could have been grown faster if you had used the, the initial, like the courts, the Kitambo? Yes, yes. The city, the city would have grown uh, much faster. Ideally, if you had just thought of uh, uh, just uh, leasing out land uh, or, or, or selling land for people to do, uh, say, say uh, residential developments, uh, factories without putting parameters. Eh? You see, like, if you're going to do any building in here, it has to be green. So for you to be able to ensure that you have a green building, you need to put those parameters in place, policies in place, so that if anybody comes on board, they know that uh, they are going to have to adhere to parameters X, Y, Z. Mm. But if it is just building any industry, that would have been a very easy process, and uh, the city would fully have mushroomed and then would be having challenges that we are trying to address because the networks are not good enough. Maybe you've exhausted the sewer capacity of the area, treatment capacity of the area. Maybe a solid waste facility of this nature would not have gotten the green energy that it deserves for it to be able to run efficiently, or even maybe would have gone the contemporary way of just doing the normal garbage collection. And the city would really have been operational, but for you to have a well-organized uh, city takes time for you to do the master planning, takes time for you to prepare the codes, uh, takes time for you to implement that to the standards that you've set uh, uh, for yourself. Konza Technopolis is a sign that with the right systems, African cities can lead the world in smart, sustainable living. But across Africa, stories like this about bold innovation, political shifts, and social transformation are unfolding every day. And the African Voice is here to tell them. So, if this story sparked something in you, share it. Start a conversation. And don't forget to subscribe for more exclusive, thought-provoking content told the African way, proudly so. I'm Steve Mokaya, and this is the African Voice.